Okay, let's have a class and our last uh, lecture for the AEM 341. Um, just something, just remind you tomorrow, uh, sorry, not tomorrow. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, it is tomorrow. Tomorrow afternoon, 2 o'clock, uh, our TA, Carly Long, will have a review for our final exam of lecture in the lab room. 2 o'clock. So you will come to join there if you needed help. So TA Carly Long will do a final exam lecture review in the lab room, 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. And I'll send you a reminder email again tonight. Uh, our first early exam, final exam, will be Thursday. So right here, 11 o'clock. If you want to take, please come in. And our second early exam will be Friday afternoon, 12 to 3, in the lab room. Both of these are first come, first serve. Okay, but the Thursday I can only do until 11, uh, until 12 uh, 30 ish, because the classroom is going to be used. And then our uh, scheduled university scheduled exam is Thursday, uh, December 15th. That is going to be 8 o'clock in the morning. That's not 11 o'clock, because 11 o'clock scheduled by the other, uh, the other, other exams. That will be 8 o'clock early in the morning. So we have these slides we're going to be briefly go over today about the virus because you heard about it all the time. And I also put a final exam practice question there. And uh, I just posted the key there. So in order to help you review, because some of you may take really quick on Thursday, this bold color is the key. Okay, we'll go over some. And this is the key. Right here, the uh, red color is the key. So this one you review is relatively very straightforward. Okay, and uh, with some of the key points we will be mentioned again during we finish the lecture section. And the lab final exam uh, grade, I will input it into eCampus today or tomorrow. You should get it very soon. Okay, uh, so that's all we have. And uh, other things, other than that, I just want to mention, I teach other classes like food chemistry uh, in our division, animal nutrition science division in the spring semester. Not this coming spring. Uh, usually every, every uh, spring. So 2024 spring I do, and in the fourth semester I teach uh, general microbiology. Okay, and I also teach food microbiology lab, uh, which is more focused on the food analysis and the pathogen detection and that will be also in the spring semester, usually, in our division. Those two classes, not many people, usually like 10 students, and this is the logic. So let's finish these, um, the final uh, slides. So we're gonna talk about virus. We basically go over, the, uh, go over the slides, okay? So first of all, a virus you need to know. Uh, this is obligate parasites. You can understand it the same as obligate parasites, but what's the difference? It is intracellular, it is in the cell, which means it needs a host. This is the key. Virus, you must need a host. This is being saying during the coronavirus time, in the last three years, people telling you in a box, a mailing box, there is a bacteria, there is a virus going to survive there. Is that going to be survived there? Yes, temporarily. But is that going to be long? Not really. Because the box surface is not a host. Unless some of the bacteria called phage, which means use bacteria as a, as a host, they can survive. You call the virus, you coronavirus, they survive on the surface will be very temporary and very limited. Besides, they may not have a good, strong, infectious capability. So these things you need to know is the common sense. So it's don't be silly when you have a mail from somewhere and then you spray with sanitizer again and again, then wipe it again and again, say that you're gonna get a contaminator from a mailing box of the coronavirus. That is just, that is just, just like a joke. When you read the definition here in a textbook, it is an obligate intracellular parasites. You must have a host. And that's universal for all the virus. 
So you know these news because these days there are some of the information is correct, some of them just scare you. All kinds of information you, and as an undergraduate, you learn at different classes. You should have your own wisdom to judge it is true or not. Like these type of thing, yes, it will be there, but it may not be too long, and it may not be have an infectious capability. So you need to know. This is we also called about colonization versus infection. That's what we mentioned. Okay, that's a two different concept. But most of the people, when they don't know these things, they mix it. They will say colonization equals infection. This is not really equal. Okay, so you need you need to know the concept behind it. Because it's a parasite, so it's incapable of independent metabolism, which means if they're on the box surfaces, they cannot do a completely metabolism, or very limited. The size could be very small, 20 nanometer, like poliovirus could be very large, 400 nanometer, like pox virus. They usually passing through the membranes. So what happened is the bacteria, if you are using 0.22 micrometer filter. We have this system in the lab. The bacteria will be entrapped, will not be passing through, but virus will pass through. And the last one, virus, only one type of nuclear gases, either DNA or RNA, but never both. <coughs> okay, how we classify the uh, classification of virus? Well, first one depends on the nuclear gases. Single-stranded, double-stranded DNA or RNA never both. And the capsid morphology. This is usually is a surface protein morphology. Whether you have an envelope or no envelope, we can say it's an enveloped or naked virus. The last one is a host range. So it's an animal, plant, uh, <coughs> bacteria, we call it a bacteriophage. So that's called a classification of virus. This is the structure of the virus. If we say the very simple, this is the structure of a virus. Capsid basically is protein. Inside is nuclear gases. And it is going to be DNA or RNA. Then what happened? These called the spikes. And the spikes looks like a crown. That's why we call them coronavirus. That's so simple, the structure. The reason is these structures are really so simple. Therefore, most of the time, they lose the target to do an antivirus. That's why the medicine for antivirus is so difficult to develop. This is a capsid. Capsid is protein. If anything which is anti-protein, it's obviously will be anti-human being. And in, inside is nuclear gases, and we learned about that. Anything anti-nuclear gases, the microorganism will generate a relatively corresponding mutation for that. So I say that the least functional function of an antivirus or antimicrobials, it is your targeting is DNA or RNA because there are so many mutations there. That's the least effective one. So this is the slides which I showed you is not enveloped virus and enveloped virus. And I tell you what it's very interesting. Lots of the people thinking about not enveloped virus is more vulnerable to antimicrobials. Oh, sorry, to antiviral drugs, but actually is not. It's more resistant. The reason is envelope the surface. These chemicals, this structure will be very easily to, to be dissolved and attacked by the antivirus drugs. So this is in the opposite direction, which is envelope the virus actually is easy to be killed. And now envelope the virus is more resistant. So here's another thing you need to know. Why our bacteria, you have antibiotics. Because bacterial surface is complicated. You have a cell membrane, cell wall system. You have a peptide of glycan. 
you have a porine, you have a LPS, so structure, virus is too simple. And you don't have a target really for those drugs to do. So that's the reason uh, the virus the drugs is always difficult to do. Even you develop some of the drugs, most of them have a very strong side effect for the human being. And they are using usually in the life threatening situation in the, in the hospital. Okay, so this is something I want to mention. This is a slide showed you different type of the virus. You see the herpes virus, uh, rhabdovirus, bacteria, phage is right there, and the, the tail of the phage, and the tobacco mosaic virus, that's the longest virus, and the mini virus, that's the largest one. So capsids, the surface capsids, right there, this is major serve as a protein coat of a virus. It's like a coat, but it's composed by virus. Um, it's protective viral genetic material and aids in its transfer between host cells. There are some units we call it a protoma, but protoma, of course, it's a, a composed by protein. That is the major comp uh, components, individual components of capsule. And the capsids could be helical, uh, ecosy helical, and complex. That depends on the morphology. So this is a helical capsid. So you can see that. It's shaped like a hollow tubes of protein walls. This is a fluid, uh, this, this is tobacco mosaic virus. The protomo is there, and the size of the protomo usually is equal to the size of the DNA, and the size of the or RNA and the size of the bacteria. It's really large. And the size of a capsid is a function of a nuclear gases. And they usually, they do, looks like it's a zebra. It's like a skirt. And this is icosahedral capsids. Icosahedral capsids looks like it's a regular polyhedron with 20 equilateral faces. And uh, it's uniformed. And that could be composed by five or six subunits. So if it's five subunits, we call it a pentamerous or pentons. If it's six subunits, we call it a hexamerous and hexons. This is a, a complex capsids. We usually call it a bacteriophage. And uh, it is a very typical structure. You see the capsid head, a nuclear gases in the center, a collar, looks like here it's a collar, and teeth, it's like a neck, and then you have a plate, which is a base, and then you have those tail, and tail is have a tail fibers. It's a very typical structure for bacteriophage, and these tail will be attached to the surface of a bacteria, and then, then the inside of the nuclear gases will be penetrated. So the genome structure of uh, DNA or RNA of the virus, they basically is, uh, is have four different types. So double-stranded DNA, we know that. Most of the DNA are double-stranded. But in the virus, you see single-stranded DNA. Uh, double-stranded RNA, we don't see often in the animals, human beings, plants, but we see that in the virus. And the single-stranded RNA, most likely dominant everywhere. Um, the chromosome size of varies, could be less than four, as less as, as four, and it could be 700 genes. And a very good example here is the influenza virus. It's a segment genome composed by eight separate pieces of the RNA. Um, the first concept here is a called eclipse phase. This is a something you understand is when you get a virus infection, there is a period of time it will not be detected. This is kind of confusing about the people. We mentioned about asymptomatic coronavirus patient. It could be person really asymptomatic. It could be in an eclipse phase, which means the bacteria during the early infection, it's not observed and it's not even detectable. But later on, it will be reappear in the cell, especially during the infectious, the infectious phase. And uh, um, we also want to say that the virus is very host specificity. So if a bacteria, 
um, as a host, we call it a bacteriophage. If it is E. coli, then it will be an E. coli phage. If it is a, a staphylococcus it will be a staphylococcus phage. They are some of the universal phage, but not too many. So you'd also need to know using bacteria phage to develop those products is one of the biocontrol methods for curing bacteria. However, there is a two limitation. <coughs> Number one is very specific. Number two, most of those bacteria phage are very effective at lower temperature. Because at the same time, at the lower temperature, most of the bacteria, they didn't grow very well. Okay, that's why it's like a hurdle uh, concept, which together with the bacteria phage at the lower temperature, they combine together, we call it a hurdle, it's going to be very effective to curing bacteria. Um, the HIV virus, usually only ex ex except only attacking the cell display class uh, class to differentiate for the CD4 uh, section. Some of the virus will be infected many different species. Let's say rabies. It's more universal for the skunks, dogs, humans, bats, especially the dogs. So we call it a crazy dog virus in the old time. And usually the, the dogs and even cats, you have to have the rabies vaccination for them. Is that right? And uh, we talk about in 2030, there is a goal for the United States, NIH or CDC, they want to declare we will have a new message to cure uh, the rabies, but it's a long way to go. And right now, if you have a rabies, you bite by a dog, you don't have a vaccination, you pretty much you, you die at the end of the day. Because you got to scare to the light, scare to the water. It's a, it's a neurological, uh, severe neurological symptoms. So that's an example of the, some viruses could infect many different species. So this is the one we usually will test you in the final exam. It's an important slide, which is tells you the viral multiplication and how they infect the host. So first of all, they have to be going inside. Therefore, they have to be attached to the host cell. The second is they're going to be entry. So how are they going to be en entry? The whole capsids together with DNA or RNA will go inside. And then they take out of the coat, take out of the capsule. So we call it uncoating of the genome. Then they will do the synthesis. But this synthesis, be careful, they're not going to do the synthesis by themselves. They will be using the material from the host to biosynthesize. They are all needed the material. And then they do the assembly. And finally, they will do the release. And at this stage, they actually have a two different type. Sometimes, they will cause is a burst, which means, let's say these are the virus, and this will be cause a burst. And we call it a lighting. But sometimes, what happened is this genome, the virus genome, instead of you are curing the, bac or the bacteria or the host, you will be together in, instead inserted. The virus genome will be <coughs> insert into the host cell. And sometimes this, this genome will be stay there forever and then later on become some of the sequence. That sequence could be virulent. <coughs> and this concept will be mentioned real quick. Okay? So these two type of the situation will be happen. Does not mean all the time the host will be burst or will be uh, break down. You can easily say, and all the, all the virus will be released again. Not, sometimes their genome is, in, is integrated. Um, the viral particles usually they, they have attachment sites. So for the non enveloped virus, because there is no coat, so usually capsid is attacking points. The enveloped virus. Now, of course, there is a proteins in the membrane. Remember, the coronavirus, they have the spikes, and they have S protein. And we get the S protein, we manufacturing the different of the vaccines. Now, although there's a debate about that, whether its safety is enough, because none of them has been really going through a serious trial. Is that right? We developed those in a one to two years, in a very short period of time. So uh, that is something questionable, whether those uh, 
whether those vaccines really help or not. And the attachment sites recognize the reception site on the target cells, and the, the uh, receptor sites could be uh, proteins, polysaccharides, and the lipids, which means all kinds of the structure on the host cell in a bacterial surface that could be the attachment sites. And the penetration and uncoating, um, there is a two different ways to do. If it's an enveloped virus, the viral membrane will be fused with the cell membrane. And they can do another way, they will generate an endosome. So this is kind of thing you can see. The enveloped the virus, they will be just do a, do a fusing. So the key words here is the fusing. The fusing with the plasma, then they attack, and then they release inside. But how about some of the other enveloped virus? They will generate is an endosome. First of, all, first of all, they will do the infusing. They will generate an endosome. And that endosome usually is a lower pH. And after lower pH, then the inside the genome with the, uh, with the capsids will be released. So this is a situation is actually very similar to what we mentioned about AB toxin. If you go back to see exam three, some of the slides, we have a, we talk about AB toxin for colobacterial diphtheria. We have the same situation. Remember there is a, it's kind of like an endosome, is a, is a lower environment, which is pH about four and five, and then that could be used to prevent the host cell, the DNA replication, and uh, sorry, the DNA translation. It's the same thing here. And this is the last one, is for the non amyl of the virus. The attacking point is, uh, is the capsids, and they, in, they go inside, they're fusing, and then they release. And usually they release the DNA RNA first, and then they use the host cell to biosynthesize their own coating. Um, this is synthesize of the viral comp components, uh, very similar to what we mentioned about before. Uh, the nuclear gases has to do replicated, then followed by transcription and followed by translation. But here is the thing, the protein translation, there is a two different stage. They not do at the same time. So there is the early proteins. They are interfere with the cells, normal function, the virus takes com commands, and they also have a later proteins. Later proteins, most of the time, is not those functional uh, structure. Usually is the only structure to hold on um, uh, to hold on the virus by themselves, like a promoter, structure proteins. So they develop the early protein, most likely is a functional for their life, and the later protein usually is a support function for the structure. And this is something we talk about assembling. So you can see they have a two different type. The base plate protein assembled with base plate, tube, tube and seeds, and then the head is do a different way because they have a pro head, DNA, mature head with DNA, and then they combine together and finally they put tail fiber proteins. So finally become a bacteriophage. And how they release. And this release structure, you look at it here, looks like it's complicated. But what's the key words here for the viral release is actually is body. And this is very similar to the broad-based budding for some of the eastern modes we mentioned in the lab. Very similar. They will be extracted, and finally the free infectious viral with envelope will be released. At this moment, at the early stage, when you see this hemoglobin will be reacted here, most likely what's going to happen is called a bleeding of the host cell. So viral release, the key words here, is the budding, very similar to similar to the broader base budding as a, as the east and the most. So next one, we want to talk about the bacteriophage a little bit. So we already mentioned that what is the bacteriophage, which means that the bacteria will be attacking by some of the virus. It's very specific. And there is a two different type of the um, bacteriophage life cycle. One is called a lytic cycle. So the cycle of bacteriophage infection result for the lysis of the cell. And the corresponding phage, we call it a lytic phage. 
Then some phages, in fact, they are targeted bacteria. They do not cause lysis. They insert DNA into the host, host chromosome like this. They cause a lysis. Therefore, this comes out with a very important <coughs> concept called the lysogenic conversion. And this is the question usually I will test you in the final exam what it is, because it's very important. Why? So we talk about the corner bacterial diphtheria already, AB toxin. And we have the same endosome. We talk about the staphylococcus toxic shock syndrome. Remember the horrible absorbent tempo. We talk about the clostridium botulism, botulism toxin, E. coli, Shigay toxin, vibrochloral toxin. Where they comes from? There is one theory. They said a long time ago, all these toxin is coming from a virus. And this virus find a bacterial cell. And instead of this bacterial cell, lytic, which means lysis of, a, of the bacterial cell, their DNA sequence is integrated into the chromosome. Some of them integrate into the plasmid. Then become a virus genome. And later on, it becomes a toxin. And this is a very good uh, hypothesis. Then have a terminology for that. It's called the lysogenic conversion. It is, uh, I will say, this is an endocytosis. The, the concept called endocytosis used in a virus. So said very simple. Why we have an AB toxin for corner bacterial diphtheria? Because there is a bacteria called, called corner bacteria, which is attacking by a beta phage. The beta phage carries on those toxins. And the beta phage, instead of the lysis corner bacteria, and then they integrated their DNA into the corner bacteria, and then later on, the bacteria phage stay there, the phage genome become a toxin. So that's the reason we mentioned about here, the endosome here is very similar. I need to show you here. I mean, you maybe forgot about that. We need to go back to see the exam three the slides. Then you will be more clear about that. Uh, usually the two. Uh, Look at the endosome here. Then, oh, oh sorry, not here. Oh, that's exam two. And go. Uh, let me show you something right here. Uh, that's lecture two, lecture one. Uh, lecture one. You there, similar? Look at the indo Look at the endosome here. pH five points. 5.0, AB toxin. Then you go look at here. Is that the same? That's the AB toxin. The AB toxin coming from a bacteriophage. They think they're coming from a bacteriophage. That's why they call it a lysogenic version. It's the same thing. This AB toxin, they think about coming from a beta phage, and it's packaged by an endosome, and this endosome in the environment, pH about 5. And then they release. Then the toxin domain, transmembrane domain becomes about that. That's later on. So it's very interesting. You can see it. When here and this other slide looks very similar. OK, so that's a very important concept, which is called lysogenic conversion. <coughs> So that's why I talk about this one first. The same thing for Shigay toxin. They think about there is a phage, which is a sh carrion Shigay toxin attacking E. coli. Then the Shigay toxin stays there, become hemorrhagic uremic syndrome symptoms. And then later on, they find 
Z E coli have serological typing O one five seven H seven. That's what it comes from. Similar like a viral chorial, that's a chorial toxin comes from our fudge. They attack it and become viral viral chorial. And what's the symptom for that? Is you lose all, all kinds of weight or lose all kinds of the water dehydration. And same thing for Staphylococcus toxic shock because that, that toxin is also coming from a fudge. So that's kind of a sim, uh, the CRE called the lysogenic conversion. Okay. Um, here we want to mention something else. There is a concept called a lysogen. The bacterial cell have the P, uh, fudge DNA integrated into the host chromosome. We just mentioned it. There is a corresponding fudge name for that is called a temperate fudge, which means it's a nice fudge. The temperate fudge usually is a fudge capable of lysogeny. Now, some of the examples, the lambda fudge is a good example for lysogeny. And there is a plofage, which means the fudge DNA integrated into the host bacterial DNA. Temporary the fudge, they could choose between lytic and the lysogeny. And the many of these bacteria cell using the lab, they all have a lysogens because you can reconstruct their, their genome. So this tells you a two different cycle. So you can see when the fudge comes in, they can go lysogenic cycle right here, integrated into a DNA, host DNA, and become a profile and they stay there, and they could become a toxin. In the other way, which is called a lytic cycle, their new fudge generate, they will be coring the lysis of the bacterial cell, and then they release the new fudge. Remember, we did this for an important experiment. We mentioned about this, which is a Mercer Chase re research. Verify that <coughs> the genetic information is the DNA, is not protein. Is that right? Because we label them a protein use S25 and the DNA use P60 or P50. So that's, we talk about when we, uh, exam three, we talk about DNA structure, we mention about that important experiment is coming from here. So we end up with something else. How are we growing virus? First of all, this picture right here is like may be misleading you. Always remember, the virus needs a host. So virus cannot grow on the agar plates because agar is not a host. But why there is something like this? Because it's a bacterial fudge, and on the agar surface, we already put a bacteria there. Then we put a virus. The virus can grow. And what they do, they cause a lytic of the virus. That's why you see those plagues there. So therefore, this is called plague forming unit. PFU, you can use to quantify bacteriophage. But the quantifier is only for bacteriophage, not for the others. And this is called a PFU. Now, they also have an acceptable range for the PFU. Remember, for CFU, the range is 30 to 300, and for PFU, is 20 to 200. Because it is relatively small, if you put too much number there, it's not easy to recognize. Okay? But be careful. You cannot direct grow virus cell. You must have a bacterial cell first. So this is one of the way to growing cultivation virus. The second way to do most of the time, we are growing there in a chicken eggs. And the embryo is a good way to, uh, to uh, cultivation virus. And the last one we do is animals and the plants if we want to have those models to do. So the plague SA, we just mentioned the dilution of virus preparation made and plated on lambda host cells. This lambda, which means you already put a bacteria there. So we have the number of plagues counted, we call the plague forming units, PFU, and we call the calculation is a number of plagues per sample dilution. We will see the concentration of the bacteriophage. And the most of the time, 
um, in the animals and the plants, typically in the animals, we are more interested about is, uh, is the virus infectious dose. So how we do it? We were doing animal research to see the dose required to cure 50% of the host cells or organisms. We call it LD50 level. But be careful. Uh, this 50% is not saying you have a 10 rabbits, you kill the 5 rabbits. Not really that. It's a set of the experiments and the finally using a model system to calculate it, which is a statistics results. Uh, statistically cure the 50% of the host cells. The level, the dose, we call it LD. Okay, so that's a major biological uh, effect for the virus. Okay, something else we want to mention besides for the virus. Uh, Varoids. Varoids is usually composed by single-stranded circular RNA. They do not encode the gene products. They require the host cell DNA-dependent RNA polymerase to do the replication. So here is something is very interesting. This is the replication is not requiring the DNA. Instead of that, they are using RNA polymerase to do the replication. This is something you easily understand. When we talk about the DNA replication, remember we talk about we need a promosome. And the promosome it does not matter its leading line or the lagging leading strand or the lagging strand, they all need RNA polymerase because RNA polymerase, no restriction. The same thing for this one is for the varroids. Okay, so the varroids is required dependent on RNA polymerase to do the replicate. They are called plant disease. It's in Philippines in 1996, caused a flooding area and all those banana trees has been killed by the varroids. And this is a picture which is for the bacterial fudge. The last one we want to talk about here is the prions. Um, this is not a bacteria, not a virus. It's a protein. It's an uh, infectious protein structure. Originally, it, will, it happened for, called the scrapes in the sheep. And then make it a big news is 1997 in England, they find the BSC, bovine sponge form encephalosophy, and uh, this is the BSE, which is causing a big meat industry uh, economic damage in European countries. And uh, in other words, it will cause medical disease. And it could be transmitted to the human beings. And there is uh, no way to prevent, the only way you do is, is, is burn, and then you bury all those uh, infected animals. Because of the BSE that, uh, that outbreaks happen, the United States today still uh, forbid, forbidden the, the imports of the beef products from China, Russia, and Australia. So those three countries, any of those uh, uh, international uh, uh, beef products, if you ship into the United States, it, it, will be, um, it will be blocked. In the other way, if in the United States you are shipping beef jerky back to China, Russia, and uh, Australia, uh, the customs will not let you go through either. So that's something started from 2003. Now in the human beings, they also will have something called CJD and the Kuro. So what that means, those type of the proteins will be completely cause a muscle relaxation. So what, what kind of symptoms they will have, the people is actually is, is laughing. And finally, they will be died because of the laughing, because of the intensive the laughing. So think about if you're laughing uh, the 24 hours and never stop, then it will be, uh, it, 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 it will be metabolically exhausted. Okay, so this is something is for the protein, really tells you, not only for virus bacteria, that other components, a simple components of the life could be cause of major damage. So that's surprise. Okay, so this is, we end up with what we have so far uh, for these virus and for the other things we briefly mentioned at the end. So let's talk about our uh, final exam gave you something to review and uh, something uh, it is important to help you to review. Uh, first of all, regardless how good you are, I hope you treat the final exam uh, seriously. 
Um, even you need only 50 points to get an A, please uh, also study normally. Uh, I don't want to see the exam paper is empty, it's only like a couple of points you answered because you only need like 40 points, 50 points. Uh, just treat it uh, normally, okay? Um, several things I want to mention because the final exam we mentioned about is, uh, is applied microbiology. So, the first thing first is this acronym, you should be very clear. So, what is, a, what is HACCP? Hazard analysis and the critical control points. What is GAP? Good agriculture practices. What is the FISMA? Food Safety and Modernization Act. What is FDA? Food and Drug Administration. What is FSIS? Food Safety and Ins Inspection Services. What is CDC? Centers for Disease Control and the Prevention. So, these acronym of these agencies are important. The second thing, what are the seven principles of HACCP? This is important. So, you should be very clear about the seven principles of the HACCP. And we can, if you forgot, we could go back to see the slides. There is a, they are very clear to tell you the seven principles of HACCP. And you have to roll that. Okay, we will have some of the writing uh, for you for the final exam because that's kind of the job uh, you should do. Not only like pick say, the answers. That the answer will be uh, right here. The seven principles. So conduct a hand analysis, determine critical control points, establish critical limits, monitoring procedures, corrective actions, uh, verification procedure, recorded keeping documentation. That's the seven principles. And this is the key is important for these seven principles. Now I have a question for you. Is the critical limits can be arranged? Of course it's not. That has to be a fixed number. And then I have a question here. During the, uh, during the um, poultry processing, why we use PAA, perioxy uh, acidic acids, instead of chlorine? Uh, because selling chicken to Russia and the EU, they do not accept the chlorine processed chicken because of chlorine byproducts issue. But you, at least you should to know, what are the number one and the number two antimicrobials using during the post-harvest poultry processing in the United States is perioxy acetic acids, PAA, and the chlorine. Those are the number one and the number two. The next topic is very important. Usually I ask you in the final exam, is why the temperature control is very important during the scattering <coughs> during the scattering process is right here because that's a very easy uh, misconcept people will be missing scattering processing you have a soft hard scattering the temperature control is very important and i said that if the temperature is lower at 35 degrees celsius 42 it's cultivation bacteria because Salmonella E. coli, they could be grown there during the processing. If it's too hot, what's going to happen? Some people are using 71 degrees Celsius or 66 degrees Celsius. What's going to happen? If it's too hot, all the fat will be extracted on the surface. Then what's going to be end up with? And we mentioned about during the chilling processing, all these fat will be accumulated on the surface. That count as organic matter will be severely decrease the impact of the antimicrobials in the chilling tank and cause cross contamination. So you can see 40% positive coming and come out will be 53%. And uh, uh, this is something you need to know. So that's why the temperature control is important. Okay? So the key answer is right here. So this is something we want to mention. Um, something else. Acquired immune system development is very important. What you should be referring to is during the final exam of the lab, I give you a sheet. Remember that sheet, a color, a black white sheet, supposed to be color. There's a two line, which is T cell line and the B cell line, which is tells you acquired immune system development. So that's why I said to refer to my class notes and the handouts. So what it means a B cell line, T cell line? Basically, you need to know the T cell line, cell mediated immune, B cell line is a homo -im -im immune. It really depends on the antigen. It's a small soluble antigen, activated B cell. 
will cause multiple cloning of the B cell. They'll have a strong memory capability. Remember, the major difference between B cell and T cell is not a membrane capability, is a B cell will generate antibody and T cell will not. And if a large complex antigen will come out, they will combine to the MHC, and uh, then the dendritic cells will be there and generate T killer cells, T help cell, T memory cells. But the memory capability will be short. Okay? So this is the key answer for the acquired immune system direct development. Other than that, what is the glutination and the opsonization? Glutination, precipitation, we cause clumping, and I said it's a test of methods. What is optimization? Optimization is your coating the surface of antibody antigen and the engulfed by the macrophage. This one, if you don't understand, you can go back to see the slides. The slides in the last lecture we mentioned about here. In this slide, we tell you very clearly what are the four or five different types of the reaction, optionization, right here, and engulfed by the macrophage, and the precipitation, you just simply cause cross precipitation, and the agglutination is a precipitation cause cross links. Okay, so these are, this is slides is important to tell you the five different interactions between antibody and antigen, plus. Can you draw a structure of the antibody? This will be some extra points for you. Can you draw it? It's not difficult to do, is that right? You have a light chain, heavy chain, uh, composed by the um, sulfide, the disulfide, the hinge, and the, you have a tail, and you have antigen combining sites. So that's uh, immune globulin structure. What is the other name for the immune globulin, by the way, is antibody. Okay, so this is something I want to uh, emphasize here. This is the lysozyme, the phagocytosis. What is called the lysozyme? What's uh, struct? What's the characteristics for the lysozyme? It's going to be breakdown one beta one for glycosidic bonds between NAG and NAN. N uh, N acido muramic acids and then N acido glucosian. So that's the one uh, we talk about. That I draw the picture on the slides on the blackboard there. Okay, while well, right here. Um, why he uh, helicobacteria can survive? Because it's have a ureus, there will be a generated ammonia and carbon dioxide. The ammonia will be buffer low pH in the stomach to the neutral pH level. 